You listen to Patriot Radio New Orleans by way of Wisconsin. This is the real deal. This is the new JFK show, and we're planning to bring the best research to you. All right, we're going to do a review of the brand new book, Mrs. Gail Nix Jackson. And of course, she was the granddaughter of Orville Nix, who photographed from the other side of Dealey Plaza and caught the assassination. And we've got a wonderful story to tell you about. We brought Larry Rivera, who has read the book, and we're going to go ahead and point out some of the most important points of the book that we feel are the most relevant, because there are many, many gold nuggets in that book, and we want to bring them out to you. Welcome to the show, Larry. Thank you, Gary. Uh, thank you for having me. Go ahead and tell us a little bit about this book that Miss Gail Nix Jackson has written. Yeah, this is a gem of a book. Miss Dick Jackson wrote this book to honor the memory of her grandfather, Orville, who took the film of the assassination from the opposite side of the street where Abraham Zagruder had been filming. He was around the intersection of Maine and Houston when the shot started that day in, in Dealey Plaza. It's not mentioned in the title or in the sport of her book, but this is not only the story of the Nick's film, Gale also interweaves the parallel story of the Zapruder film in the narrative, and she comes up with some very interesting trivia about that film as well that perhaps uh, the reader might not have known about. She states in her board some very interesting items, and I'll just uh, go over them real quick. First of all, regarding the mainstream media and how they have tried to convince us that Lee Oswald acted alone and refused to investigate conspiracy evidence, quote, for fear of losing their biggest financial backers, which were, is the government, unquote. Also, she mentions in her foreword about the inadequacies that haunted Orville, her grandfather, throughout his life, and how they still taint uh, his memory. Also, wanted to point out how, quote, Thomas Bacon, early in the book, as marvelous quote, truth is the daughter of time, and in her case, I would have to say the granddaughter, because she was the granddaughter of Orville Nix. And then she calls on citizens to ask questions of our government, and uh, that it is time to demand the truth. Basically, uh, this book is a call for action. A little bit of background on uh, Orville Nix. Uh, he grew up uh, one of six siblings in Texas, and uh, like all young men and young children of his day, he had to help his family in the uh, daily chores and actually picked cotton in the time that everybody, everybody had to work. You know? And uh, his younger brother, Edward, was prone to seizures as a young boy. And Orville actually uh, witnessed some of these events. So this made quite an impression on young Orville as he was growing up. Later on, this is important because at that day in Dealey Plaza, there was an event like that which drew his attention. Now, uh, moving forward, Orville was pretty good friends with Forrest Sorrells. They knew each other very well because they played golf together, they played cards, they uh, were members of the same country club. But they met at the General Services Administration where uh, Orville was an air-conditioned technician, repairman. So uh, Orville was always interacting with uh, these government employees and government people. And uh, that's how uh, he got to uh, become friends with Boris Sorrells. And this is important because Boris Sorrells spoke some very candid words with Orville during the time of the assassination, at the time of the assassination, and in the aftermath, and some of that information, I believe, has never been revealed before, and that's why uh, this book is extremely important because it gives us the viewpoint of some of these individuals that only somebody who had known them and somebody who was uh, a Dallasite. Uh, could have known. It seemed as though there was like a click of people within the Dallas area and it seemed that Gail was around them and heard things where she was just old enough not to be told to go to her room and, and witness the trials and tribulations of her grandfather. Yeah, and also a lot of the people uh, in the area that over the years, according to Gail, 50 years later are still reluctant to uh, talk about uh, what they saw that, that weekend. Wow. Okay. Now it's very interesting to know that Sorrell actually consulted with Orville Nix about the parade route that day. I've never heard that. Is, yeah, I think it's important to know because later on she tells us, like I said, uh, that Sorrell shared some very personal opinions about the assassination with Orville, and these have never been published anywhere. Now, like I said, <clears throat> these are things that only a good personal friend would know. Now, on November 22nd, the entire family, or Nix family, had made plans to go see the president. The only one that wasn't in the group was actually uh, Gail's father, Orville, who was working that day. In the family, she narrates about how uh, 
there were differences of, of opinion, of political wise. For example, Orville was Orville Senior. Uh, his grandfather was a Democrat. Uh, Orville Junior, Dale's father, was a Republican. You know, one member of the family favored uh, one of the newspapers, the Dallas Morning News, and actually, Orville actually favored uh, the uh, Times Herald. That morning, they noticed the uh, change in the parade route, and Ella, Ella is Orville was Orville's wife, who would be Gail's grandmother. Right away that morning, Ella noticed the Welcome Mr. Kennedy <clears throat> ad that had been posted by Bernard Wiesman, and uh, she remarked something about the cost of something as trashy as that. On the day of the assassination, uh, young Gail, her mother Elaine, and grandmother Ella were supposed to meet up with Orville, and Orville had driven his car two hours before the assassination to find a parking space. Uh, actually, what he did was he parked uh, at the uh, Terminal Annex building, which was the building where he worked out of. They separated, and they did not all uh, drive down there together because he, they didn't, he didn't want the, the girls, I call them, to just be standing around you know, for so long. So they, um, they separated, and Orville drove early, <clears throat> and then later on he would drive everybody back home. The girls took the bus. And later on, they were supposed to meet, and we'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. Now, as the parallel, she interjects here. She goes on and she uh, starts going into the Sapruder uh, film. She talks about Sapruder's <coughs> preparation that day, and it's very interesting. Uh, this one point that she makes about Harold Bird, and Harold Bird has been the uh, owner of the uh, CSBD building, and how uh, he was absent that week. He wasn't in Dallas. He was on a safari uh, in Africa, and he wasn't uh, there at all. All right, now this bird seller was part of the Civil Harris Patrol with David Ferry. Lee Oswald was in it. Bill Shelley was actually highly suspicious of being CIA. So this Texas School Book Depository building is not just some building that just happened to be there. Oh, of course not. William Weston <coughs> did uh, extensive research on the background of the owners and the people that ran uh, not only the building, but uh, the TSPD company itself, whose president and owner was Jack Kaysen. And all these people were members. For example, Kaysen was the commander of uh, the American Legion Post 53. Uh, and these were extremely right-wing organizations in Dallas. The fact that also that the company itself had uh, only moved into the uh, location of 411 Elm Street, that summer uh, is, as William Weston uh, writes, is extremely suspicious. Zapruder had his company in the uh, next, in the uh, Dow famous Dow Tech building. Yeah, the Dow Tech building, which is right uh, in front of the, uh, when facing the Houston Street. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, for those who don't know, it's the Dallas Textile Building. I always thought it was the Dallas, Texas building, but it's actually a textile building with serious CIA connection. Well, and also that's where most of the uh, tex textile uh, uniforms and, and uh, other dress manufacturing companies were housed, and that's where they worked out of. And she has some very uh, interesting personal details about even the Pruder's uh, life. For example, he was uh, he had cold, cold sweat. That he was a member of the uh, Mason, the uh, Dallas Council on War on World Affairs, and uh, those kind of things. Yeah, I was uh, wondering about those Pruder There is just something not exactly 100 percent with him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and and then she goes on and she keeps and she keeps interjecting some very interesting details about the Pruder parallel. And you'll find the reason why later on in the book, because the treatment that one film got versus the other. And maybe uh, Gail might, might have felt a little bit of resentment over the years regarding uh, those two treatments, you know. And so, uh, and it's very natural, because you'll see later on <clears throat> that you know, she actually uh, termed the mixed film as uh, the runt of the litter. And uh, that's basically what happened. Uh, over the years, with uh, when one film was treated in one way and the other film was treated the other way, mm -hmm. so um, <clears throat> we'll continue here. On the day of the assassination, like I said, uh, they were supposed to meet <clears throat> at the Walgreens on Main Street, uh, close to that Adili Plaza, uh, in case they got lost or separated. They uh, obviously, because of the assassination, they didn't uh, get to meet. What happened was that uh, Gail had to go to the had to go to the bathroom, 
at the worst conceivable moment. And that's how, at the time that the motorcade drove by, <clears throat> the girls uh, were not there. Orville went ahead and, and he uh, he went and, st and filmed the uh, movie that would uh, make him such an important uh, part of U.S. history. Okay, uh, now she talks about the actual camera, and uh, this was a Keystone K810, the wind-up mechanism. And, uh, it operated with a focal length of nine millimeters, twenty-seven millimeters. It was self-adjusting to light sensitivity. And the grip, the handle, allowed the, the operator to film with only one hand. In other words, you didn't have to have both hands on a camera then in order to uh, work this uh, camera. Then we go back to the uh, Bruder, and she talks about how Bruder almost did not take his place in history because he had forgotten his Bell and Howell and his secretary Lillian convinced him to go back home and get it because he had ample time before the parade w would reach their location. Then uh, the recruiter asked Marilyn Sitzman, who was 5'11", that's something that I, I didn't know about, that she was that tall, to come with him down to uh, the uh, abutment where he had finally stood to stabilize him as he filmed because of his vertigo. Then uh, she goes a little bit into the Dallas and the Texas politics and the bickering that was going on at the time and how <clears throat> JFK was trying to corral LBJ which I thought was a great metaphor, you know, for being in Texas, you know. And then uh, uh, she mentioned uh, about the other Dallas interests that were conspicuous, <clears throat> conspicuously out of town. And apart from third, she uh, doesn't mention which interests these were. But I guess you can imagine uh, some of these uh, people who uh, must have been uh, prescient <laughs> It must have been uh, Nostradamus, you know, and they, uh, that uh, they, uh, you know, actually were out of town during the week of the assassination. So that gives you something to think about. Mm -hmm. uh, now, <clears throat> when the girls went into the Walgreens, they walked past two gentlemen uh, in suits and dark uh, sunglasses, and one of them handed her mother, Elaine, one of those welcome Mr. F Mr. Kennedy flyers, mm -hmm. and uh, what she did was she actually put it on one of those uh, trays that they use, you know, for uh, a dirty plates, you know, have been used in the uh, in the restaurant, and they have them all stacked there. That's where she that's where she placed the ad. So, and they walked into the Walgreens. Uh, that's what happened there. While the girls were inside, uh, at around 12:15, that's when the epileptic uh, event happened on on Houston, and that's what uh, Orville witnessed, and obviously it reminded him of what his brother used to go through, Edward, who I mentioned earlier, and uh, obviously that version worked, because it drew the attention of everybody that was there to the ambulance, and what was going on there, and uh, the man that was laying uh, convulsing there on the street. Orville noted the speed of the motorcade is only five miles an hour. Now, uh, I wanted to go into that in a little bit more detail. <clears throat> now, Orville noted the speed of the motorcade is only five miles an hour. Now, and that's pretty slow. And that, that's, uh, I, we confirmed that with what the motorcycle officers all said in interviews that we have uh, transcribed uh, recently. And some of these motorcycle officers might have, been, might have uh, said that it was even slower, especially as they turned the L, to what they would call walking speed. So where the, you'd have to put your feet down in order to stabilize the motorcycle, okay? Now, we have uh, Emery Roberts, who was the Secret Service agent in charge of the follow-up car, Queen Mary, and he was in the, on the front seat passenger side of uh, the follow-up car, which was, is where all the Secret Service agents were. And Emory Roberts wrote in his report that the uh, motorcade was going between 20 and 25 miles an hour. Now, how does that compare to what Orville states, uh, as Gail writes in her book, we're talking about two totally different events. And not only that, 
He also, uh, Emory Roberts I'm talking about, uh, said that uh, they were approximately 20 to 25 feet behind the president's car. And anybody who sees a Zapruder or a film or that L.C. Dorman film can tell you that that's a total lie. That was not the distance between the two limos. In fact, in the Dorman film, the uh, Queen Mary is almost tailgating the uh, JFK limo. That's how close they are as they are, as they are proceeding uh, on uh, Houston Street. And you can also see that in the next film. When uh, the motorcade turns on to Houston, that's where you can start, that's where Orville starts his film. And uh, so, right there, where uh, we can appreciate, you know, that uh, the information contained in the book totally refutes what Emory Roberts uh, stated. Uh, and I can even give you the uh, location here of the documentation it's in the volume 18, page. 810 to 813. Yeah, you're talking about the head of the Secret Service, Emmy Roberts. Yeah, who, who was the head of the detail, of the Secret Service detail that day. <clears throat> and held back a couple of guys, right. And Yeah, and for those who uh, might, uh, just to uh, jog your memory a little bit, that's the uh, person who signaled Henry Ripka uh, away from the running board at Love Field, which uh, was later discovered... Uh, to be in the Wolfer film as the, as the uh, motorcade was leaving Love Field uh, you can see uh, Emery Roberts uh, motion uh, Henry Ripka to uh, get away and to stay uh, at Love Field <laughs> you know <clears throat> so that's, yeah. uh, can't have a secret service on the running board it might jump on top of the president and take all the bullets that's them, yeah and, and uh, so we we sort of know uh emory roberts uh role in all this in fact he uh he made himself quite unavailable after the after the assassination i bet he and, did <laughs> yeah some uh, even uh, speculate that he might have committed suicide you know from you know all of the uh remorse you know that he felt uh, it's, it's one or the other. Either you uh, it's because you know too much, or you feel too bad. <laughs> so, no yeah. telling about O. Emery. But he, I'm sure he had plenty on his mind to deal with in front of the yeah. early gates. Yeah. Now, now I think the uh, best evidence that Orville was right about the speed of the motorcade is the fact that uh, if you uh, trace the movements of Ike Alton when he takes the Alton's five. We know that uh, the motorcade is on Houston Street. And uh, he's also standing uh, around the same group as Orville, actually. And then he has enough time to run or jog across the infield of Dealey Plaza, and he gets to the curb of Elm Street in time to snap the next photo, which was the famous Austin Six which catches a uh, doorman and catches the president with his uh, hands uh, yeah, uh, ready to clasp to his, his throat in response to a bullet and Jackie is holding his, his wrist and you know that famous photo that everybody is <clears throat> that we've talked about so much mm -hmm. yeah we're gonna all right don't forget about that photo we'll be right back this is real deal with Larry Rivera Gary King and the man Jim Fesser this is the real deal we'll be right back Welcome back to The Real Deal with Larry Rivera, Gary King, and we're going to continue discussing the book Arville Nix, the missing JFK assassination film, and Larry's been talking about it, and we just left off at the Algen 6 photograph that we were talking about. All right, go ahead, Larry. I guess we need to step it up a little bit. Yeah, so as we're running this parallel between Alton and Nix, who are standing uh, almost at the same location as Maine and Houston, we realized that Orville did not move that as far as like Alton sort of stayed right there at Main Street which is from there, is from where he took his film. At exactly, and I find this extremely interesting, that Orville was looking right at the Hertz sign when it flashed 12.30, and that's when he, he heard the report of gunfire, and he recognized it right away as such. When the shooting started, he saw people diving all over the place, you know, hitting the deck, as they say in the military, scream, general pandemonium all around him, and Orville did not know what to do. So instinctively, he ran 
but at the same time, he did not know that he was actually filming. Now, Gail doesn't mention this in the book, but uh, I recently, and I recently had a talk with her regarding this, uh, it's, and it's about the tilt in the Nix film. And with, if you look at the Nix film, when he shoots the Elm Street sequence, you notice that Elm Street looks like it's going uphill, when it's completely the opposite. Elm Street, as it moves east to west, goes on quite a pronounced downslope. And, but if you look at the next film, you'll see it's, it's totally the opposite. And the result of this, as Dale told me, is that as since he didn't know he was he was recording and he was filming, he was just running around like everybody else trying to uh, protect himself. And uh, he didn't know that he was filming. So, and, and only later on when they developed the film did they realize that this is, had happened. That's the reason why you see that tilt in the Orville Nix film. I never thought about that. Yeah, yeah. And it's very fascinating that Orville overheard, and this is what really, really makes one a little upset, that he overheard people who were actually assaulting about JFK and how he deserved it. And I'm quoting right here from the book. Uh, he deserved it. I hope he said that, that damn communist. Wow. And, yeah. And Orville's reaction was he wanted to punch these people out. That's something that I had never heard about. So, and this is, you know, one of the, like I said, one of the uh, details that come out in the book that are, that you don't read anywhere else. Now, well, Orville was sure that the shots came from the fence, and he, throughout his life, he was adamant, adamant about that. He never, never deviated from that. So, as he was sure that the shots came from the fence, and that's where he headed after the gunfire ceased, and Jeff K's limo sped away. All of this pandemonium is going on. He remembered uh, about his beloved girls. And he went immediately to the Walgreens. He turned around and went to the Walgreens on Main Street. When he walked in, the girls noticed that he had been crying. And his demeanor <clears throat> at the time was, was obviously of some who had seen such a tragedy, who had seen such an event, a despicable event. At the time, during in, in all this grief that he was going through, he happened to find enough sentiment here to humor Gail, where he told her uh, that he had actually waved at the president for, for little Gail. It sort of tells you, you know, gives you an idea of what type, what type of person Orville Nix was and how stoic he, uh, he must have been during these trying times, you know, and when he witnessed uh, the assassination. Going back to the uh, what happened with the Z film, and this part is something that's very, very gripping here, to say the least. This is where she describes the actual fight, tug of war going on between uh, the Dallas Morning News and the Times Herald over the Zapruder film. And the two individuals involved here were Harry McCormick and Darwin Payne. And it just so happens that McCormick got there first. Erwin Schwartz, who was the Buddha's lawyer, was the one who came and, and was sort of the arbitrator in this fight. Since McCormick got there first, he was the one that went with the Buddha to WFAA. During all this time at WFAA, uh, Schwartz is handling the camera with the valuable film inside. You know, he wouldn't let that camera out of his sight at this time, obviously. While they were interviewing Zapruder, and we know that we have that interview here, and we're going to play it right now, where Zapruder clearly says that I must have been in the line of fire. All right, and, here we go. Uh, where the gun was uh, allegedly fired from that killed President Kennedy. I must Kennedy. have been in the line of fire. Today. Excuse me, go ahead, sir. I must have been in the line of fire. I see now the picture where I was. I was right on that uh, concrete block, as I said. And as I explained before, as a sickening scene. At first, I thought perhaps it's a. Uh, it sounded like somebody make a joke. You hear a, a shot and somebody grabs their stomach. All right, there's the pruder in his own words. The pruder, that's right. And Gail astutely notes that this was the only time. This was the only time in his life that the pruder talked about where the shots came from. The truly where the where the shots came from in reality. Later on, he quote unquote corrected himself and said that they could not have come from behind him. And you know we know that that uh, that must have been under pressure. Right. This forever. interview was just minutes after the assassination. Yeah, this just was, minutes. That was right. That's right. Exactly. And that and everybody was uh, telling the truth. Out, you know. Everyone was and, telling the oh, truth. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and uh, they wanted to put her, you know, to uh, say what he had just witnessed, and he uh, he said uh, he, he said, told him. Then go, Gail goes into the details of, of uh, the movement of the Zapruder that that day and evening, and it pretty much parallels uh, what uh, Douglas Horn tells uh, tells us 
in the, inside the ARRB uh, about the film. First going to Kodak at 240, and then from there going to the Jameson Film Company, and about the uh, 16 mill millimeter un unslit uh, version of the film, and how they made three copies that day and whatnot. So then <clears throat> later on that night, Orville, when he gets home, he noticed that the uh, film indicator had gone down to 23, from 23 to 23 feet from 25. So at that moment, he didn't think that he had that he had anything, that he had uh, filmed anything, and he was going down and everything, and because he didn't think that he had any, that he had filmed the assassination. Still, that night, as they were talking within the family, Orville kept saying uh, he thought the shots came from the fence. And uh, this is where we're going to play that uh, clip, uh, Gary. Where did the shots come from? Where did you hear the shots come from? From a fence uh, between the book depository and the railroad track. Cut, cut, cut. Now, Mr. Nix, where did you hear the shots come from? It came from a fence. Cut, cut, cut. They finally pulled him aside, this man did, and pulled him aside and said, Now, Mr. Nix, what did the Warren Commission say? Where did they say these shots came from? From the book depository. And they said, that's right, and that's what we want you to say. And I remember riding home with him. He was so upset. I mean, he would hit the, the driving wheel, the steering wheel, and say, why? I mean, they try and make me look like I'm insane. And I know that's where they came from. I know that's where the shots came from. And then that evening, as, you know, one family member is talking, you know, uh, to the other, very interesting, the observations of Gail's father, Orville Jr., where he spoke to his grandfather that evening uh, over the phone. Right, right there, they knew who was behind the assassination, commented on how fast the DPD had, had their man. Lee Oswald said he was a patsy, and right away that uh, funny things were going on that day in Dallas. So the next morning, Orville went downtown with Ella, his wife, and he wanted to recreate everything for Ella because he still had all these thoughts in his mind, and that night he was crying and he was so upset. Saturday morning, 23rd, and, and you can see this in the Orville Mix film after the uh, assassinations. You can see that early in the morning, <clears throat> and it's at 7.30 a.m., and you can see the Hertz sign where, where it's reading uh, the temperatures, 36 degrees. And that's the next morning. Everybody thinks that that might have been that same night, but no, it's, uh, it's the next morning. And he went and he uh, sort of recreated his film. And In fact, you can see right there that the Elm, Elm Street is going in the right tilt because there he's looking through the viewfinder. And he described for Ella everything, and Ella went and she looked uh, everything over. And because, uh, you know, Orville wanted to uh, make sure that everything, uh, that he, if he had anything in his, in his camera, that he could sort of recreate what had happened. He talked about how he wanted to see the president a little closer. His comedic comments to Ella were, I remember looking toward that part of the park that doesn't match the rest, the part that has a fence. Do you know where I mean? And Ella nodded in her head in agreement and Ar Orville said and I remember thinking that's where the shots were coming from then his voice faltered as he put his head into his hand and he began to cry again give us an idea <clears throat> of the emotional state of Orville this this happened the night before what I just described then the next morning is when they went to the Plaza during all this time Orville still has the film in his camera and it has not been uh, developed it's not, it has not been processed yet I thought that Gail could have answered if they had any regrets. They didn't realize the importance of what was contained in the film. And had they, did they have any regrets as far as uh, not taking the initiative to develop the film and make copies before the FBI took it? But, you know, that's hindsight, and the hindsight is always 2020. <laughs> you know how that goes. Yeah. Now, we're going back to the Zapruder. <clears throat> as she uh, described, the Zapruder's personal wealth multiplied substantially. And at a time when he was going to get paid $150,000 in 25,000 increments, $25,000 increments. Orville, on the other hand, would only receive $5,000 total in his lifetime. Mm. Right there, we start to see how different one film was treated from the other. Even though, uh, later on we'll see, we uh, talk about Jones Harris's uh, research, that the next film was actually even more important because it captured the action of about what happened at the picket fence. This is a very interesting quote here that she, that she writes about. Though their journeys into this event parallel, they diverge soon after. Some would say that their experiences were just another example of the American way in action. Capitalism, secrecy, and the inequality between the rich and poor that still rears its ugly head today. It's pretty eloquent as far as 
you know, the treatment of one film and the other. And then she talks about how Captain Doc and his famous memo and how uh, they thought that the American people, you know, their psyche was too fragile to handle this tragedy and how uh, everything had to be uh, set out in, in a way that everybody could accept that this could happen in America. And later on, as Orville and, and Ella discussed, the incompatibility of what was being reported in the media in the media and Ella had her own opinion when she saw Lee Oswald in the, in the uh, on TV and she said good lord Orville that man doesn't look strong enough to even fire a rifle once let alone four or five times it was pretty interesting uh, coming from Ella Orville you know shook his head in agreement what I don't understand Ella is why I heard shots from the fence so throughout the book Throughout uh, the narrative here, she, she, she's always, always focusing on where Orville so many times said uh, that the shots came from. So at times he would even get upset with Ella, you know, and he'd tell her, are you, are you saying I'm losing my mind? I heard shots come from the damn fence. She uh, talked about something that uh, not too many people are aware of. In the Lamar, the Lamar Hotel, there was a suite 8F in Houston. And uh, many of these people were the members, the people who actually ran Texas, and they were members of the Dallas Citizen Council. And these included, actually, uh, the wounded governor, John Connolly, and, of all people, Abraham Zapruder. Sort of get a, a feeling here of, of in, uh, her opinions of some of the people that might have been behind what happened in Dallas. The next Monday, which was November 25th, Orville finally runs into Soros. And they start discussing the assassination. Now, at this time, Soros realizes that Orville might have filmed the, the shooting. And uh, Orville asked Forrest where he thought the shots came from. What did Soros say? Something that obviously you know, we never knew about before. But Soros was having his own issues about the assassination. He told Orville that he, he thought he saw men firing from the fence. But then he tells him, and I think this is of extreme importance here because this is something that this happens to dovetail with something that I have been working on myself. And it has to do with the Alton 7. The Alton 7 is the third photograph of that three photograph sequence. It's the five that we just spoke about, the six. But the Alton 7 is the image where we see Clint Hill from behind and Jackie is helping him into the limo. Uh, if you look close at the image, at the photograph, and you enlarge it, you will see the lead car in front, which was being driven by Jesse Curry. Originally, this photograph, as it was presented to the American public, was cropped. And it was cropped for several reasons. It was cropped because you can, when you look at the uh, original photograph, <clears throat> you can see that the tail, the tail light, the brake lights are on, which means that the, uh, the curry was either that the uh, car was either stopped or it was in the process of stopping. Okay, and then the second issue in the photograph happens to be that you can see Chief uh, Sheriff Decker, who was sitting on the left uh, back seat facing uh, the front. He's turned around. I mean, you can see it clearly that he's turned around completely, 180 degrees. He's not looking for the front. Now Soros told Orville that he kept having these dreams where I keep seeing his head blow up. Now, in order for Soros to have seen his head blow up, he had to have been turned around as well, the same as Sheriff Decker. I thought this was something, uh, quite a revelation. Now, we're starting to get a little bit more details. And if you look at that image, of that photograph, I've suspected all along that the photo has been doctored, has been altered, just the same as the Austin Six. And uh, the area where Soros would have been has been blackened out, has been uh, worked on. And not only that, you can also see like a little sliver, you know, coming off the flag, the presidential flag that also uh, interferes where where you would have seen Curry. I've had my suspicions that all the uh, members that were in the lead car were turned around in the same way that Decker is, watching the assassination, watching uh, the headshot, the 313. And, and, and why, why crop the picture if nothing's going on? That's right, and in that when the crop picture uh, first came out in the New York Times, which I have a copy of, they cropped out Decker and they cropped out the tail light, which showed the brake light on. See, because if you don't have both both tail lights, you, you cannot appreciate that, that the brakes are being pressed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in the the uh, original, 
you can see the entire image and you can see, like I said, uh, Decker turned around and you can see the brake lights on. When you look closely, you can appreciate, you can see uh, that the image, the picture has been altered just the same as the Austin 6. Now the camera finally reached uh, the count of zero when Orville went and filmed the halftime entertainment at the South Oak Cliff High School football game the following Saturday night which was after Thanksgiving because the weekend of the assassination, all the football games, all the all activities had been canceled. And this was the first of December when he finally finished the film that, that was in, in the camera. That night, he finally took the film over to Dynacolor, which was the company that would process it. Dynacolor called him later that night and asked him to come downtown if they needed to see him. And this is at 2 in the morning. So at 2 in the morning, he goes with, the, he calls his son Orville, and they both drove down there. Obviously, uh, during this time in the drive, you know, uh, he's having all these thoughts of all the money he might get if the film showed anything. And thinking about what Abraham Bruder had gotten from life, thinking if uh, maybe his film was better, which uh, later on, you know, obviously we, we know that it is. During this time, uh, he was kept talking with Orville where he, again, he, where he thought the shots had come from. And they must have viewed the film over at Dynacolor at least 30 times. So he had a, a pretty good idea of what that film contained. So that later on when it was returned, and when he saw it later on, he noticed that frames had been taken out, that the film had been altered. Only oh, Monday clips was... of that, too. Mr. Nix, where were you on November 22nd, 1963? Standing on the corner of Maine and Houston. And did you take any pictures of the presidential limousine as it went through Dealey Plaza? Yes, I've taken pictures before and after, before the assassination and during the assassination. And you know, of course, that your pictures were eventually used by the government to determine where the limousine was when some of the shots were fired. Yes. Did you deliver a copy of your film to the federal government? Yes, I delivered a copy of my film to the federal government about December the 1st. About a week, a little over a week after the assassination. Yes, my film got lost in the processing plant. Where is the original film? The original film belonged to United Press International. Uh, the government has a duplicate copy. And where is that duplicate copy? In the archives. And is that the duplicate copy which was used by the Warren Commission for the purpose of determining, along with other films, much more film and it's a fruit of film where the presidential limousine was when some of the shots were fired i would say so well you now have a copy of your film which you were kind enough to show to us this afternoon is that copy the same as the original which you gave to the fbi on december 1st i would say no there is some films may be missing some uh, frames some of the frames were ruined does the film which you have at the present time have the same number of frames as the film which you delivered to the FBI on December 1st? I would say no, but it's cause of losing maybe a, a, a frame here and there. At the time the shots were fired, did you look at the book depository building? No. Uh, did you think at that time that the shots came from the book depository building? No, I thought it came from a fence between the book depository and the railroad track. Most ever one thought it came from the fence behind the book depository. Yeah, so the following Monday, Orville was finally able to describe to Soros what the film contained and where he thought the shots came from. And then now Soros knew this. Obviously, uh, Soros never pursued the truth, and he just told the line, you know, the official version. Let's not forget that Soros and, and, is and, and, Secret Service. Secret Service yeah, well, of it's under, Yeah, it's understandable because, you know, what he was up against, obviously, uh, this machinery. When uh, they went to New York, that's when uh, Orville called uh, Time Life and he told them that he had, had filmed the assassination, so Time Life paid for their plane tickets and, you know, they went to New York. After everything was said and done at Time Life, determined that the film only had nuisance value. Nuisance value only. Nuisance. Mm. Said, Mr. Nix, we find this film to have nuisance value only. Still in all, we'd like to offer you $3,000 for it. Now, Orville thought this was a slap in the face, and as much as uh, they, he thought that, you know, why uh, fly him all the way to New York, you know, to say that the film, you know, has nuisance value only. And so they were, he was very insulted, and they just walked out of there. And as, uh, when they went down, when you got down to the lobby, they ran into the uh, people from UPI. UPI went in and said, hey, they want the film, you know, and so and they uh, gave him $5,000 for the film. Uh, at that time, they had an agreement that UPI would never mention his name. 
Well, you that uh, agreement didn't last five minutes. They they uh, they broke it immediately as far as you know who had taken the film. On December the seventh, Fox Movie Tone ran the newsreel in movie theaters. That's when uh, Ben Jones saw it, and Ben Jones went and established contact with Orville on uh, the eighth of uh, December, and that's when uh, a lifelong uh, relationship uh, started between the two. You know, Ben Jones and and Orville. Actually, really uh, got al along uh, pretty well. Ken Jones actually told Orville that he had to be very careful because Ken Jones had already started to notice that people had a nasty habit of, of, of dying <laughs> in uh, people who were related to the assassination. This is when the threats started, actually, to uh, be received, you know, strange phone calls at the, at the Nick's household. So uh, he was right. Ken Jones was right. And he was very worried. That they said to him, I don't think you should tell many people uh, that you took this. Then UPI published the uh, book about the Knicks and the much more uh, frames entitled uh, Four Days. And as Gail uh, talks about it, they made their money within the first day. The $5,000 investment, they probably made it the very first day that that book was on sale. UPI obviously <clears throat> was in it for the money. They weren't in this uh, to... Uh, find out the truth about the Kennedy assassination and what happened behind the picket fence. And uh, so that's, uh, that's pretty well established throughout the, after, after that when uh, he goes into uh, the details of how uh, UPI handled the film uh, thereafter. All right, so let's go on to about um, what happens as far as the curator of the film. Okay, uh, now going into the details of the people at UPI who handled the next film, uh, it's very, very important to mention uh, these two figures, and they were Bert Reinhardt and Reese Schoenfeld, because they were the people uh, at UPI who were, who were in charge of the next film. And Jones Harris uh, 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 was given a uh, frame of the next film, and... <clears throat> Harris saw uh, some figures uh, behind the picket fence, and there's two very, very important figures that come out at this time in the, in the next film, and one is the figure of a policeman uh, who is standing on what was Honest Joe's gun and pawn shop, uh, and right, it, it would, we'd have to go into a whole hour to discuss Honest Joe, but uh, suffice it to say that Honest Joe uh, had an Edsel that had been converted uh, as a billboard, as a moving billboard. And uh, he'd go around town, you know, announcing and uh, advertising his, his uh, pawn shop, which was on Elm Street. And uh, uh, Jones Harris discovered two figures. One was that of a policeman standing on the running board uh, with a, uh, what looked like a long-barreled gun of some sort. And uh, also, there was another figure that was discovered, and we'll call him Red Bandana Man, who also had a weapon. And uh, Jones, Jones Harris discovered that this was of extreme importance. So he gave the film of these uh, images, these uh, frames, to uh, Bernard Hoffman. And Hoffman, happens to be the same guy that Joan Harris contracted to work, uh, do the early work on the Austin Six. And uh, so they, they, uh, they saw this, you know, and, and they went and they took the, uh, <coughs> these images to these people and uh, <coughs> they discovered that UPI wasn't interested in any, in any of this. <clears throat> and then from there, Joan Harris took the uh, images to Richard Billings, who was assistant editor of Life, and he sat down with these people to discuss, you know, what was in the uh, what was in, the, in these frames. And uh, and Billings, uh, Joan Harris had a meeting with Billings, <clears throat> and Billings, you know, was actually crying, you know, and and so was his uh, higher up, who was uh, George Harris, and they showed the, them uh, the images. And these people were so upset by what Jones Harris showed them that they were uh, that they were actually crying. They were upset. But at the end, their answer to Jones was 
that they felt they had already given sufficient space to the Kennedy assassination and that there was absolutely nothing that they could do. So that uh, sort of uh, summarizes, you know, how all these uh, multimedia giants felt about uh, solving the JFK assassination, especially with uh, these images which were of so, so which were so important in uh, figuring out what happened behind the picket fence. So, uh, <clears throat> then, uh, obviously, uh, the uh, film that uh, Orville saw in New York wasn't the film that he had seen in Dallas, and he suspected that the FBI had done something to it. And then uh, what happens is that uh, Nick is trying to get his camera back. And he <coughs> keeps sending letters to the FBI because he had given uh, he, he had given them the camera and uh, on January the 29th, and uh, months went by, and the camera you know uh, they couldn't produce a camera. The, uh, so when they finally uh, gave the, gave him the camera, it was in pieces. And uh, this is something that uh, of extreme importance because. As uh, James Norwood, our colleague at the OIC, uh, noted, uh, that, and I'll quote here uh, in an email that he sent me, another essential moment in the book is the dismantling of the Nick's camera by the FBI. This act, a willful destruction of a vital piece of evidence, rendered the camera useless from an investigative standpoint. Yeah, there's so many things to talk about yet of this. This incredible book, uh, and I'll just you know fast forward to uh, what happened. Terry Mack was friends with uh, Gail, and Gail was tr trying to locate the the film <coughs> from uh, UPI, and they, she, they kept giving her the runaround. So when uh, 25 years was up, as far as the copyright was concerned, it was supposed to revert back to the family. So Gail uh, decided to go ahead and, and ask for the film. After they kept giving her the runaround, they said, no, another three years. So finally, she sends Robert, uh, Gary Mack recommends Robert Groden to go and, and touch the film for her. Apparently, the film went through even more changes. By the time she got it back, there seemed to have been some cropping at the uh, edge of the uh, picket fence. Uh, frame, vital frames were missing. And then one, one time, she went then, uh, up to Pennsylvania to see Groden, and she asked him point blank if he had uh, done anything to the film. And as she describes the uh, event, you know, he looked down, he uh, wouldn't make, make eye contact with her, and uh, Groden said no, that he, you know, that, uh, that's exactly what he received from UPI. <clears throat> then he went and he asked uh, his wife about the same thing, and she did, you know, she had sort of the same, sort of the same uh, reaction, which leads us to speculate, this is speculation, okay, that, that Groden might have had something to do with her creation of the next film. Well, this is with the indication that we can read here, you know, read between the lines. You know, that's pretty much what the conclusion that one comes uh, at when reading the book. Then uh, in the 2000s, uh, her father, who was the sole inheritor of her grandfather's estate, negotiated a deal with the Sixth Floor Museum. That's where the Sixth Floor Museum comes in. He actually transferred all uh, copyright of not only uh, uh, the film, but of all letters, correspondence, and documentation related to the film, including some of Gail's own work, which uh, really upset Gail when she wanted to, by the time when she writes this book, she wants to use some of the images from her own grandfather's film. The Sixth Form Museum would not allow her to do it, or uh, rather they, they, would do it, they would do it only if she paid for the license. They would license her to use the images from the film that her grandfather took 50 years ago. Now, I think that's outrageous, outrageous behavior by the Sixth Floor Museum. It sort of parallels what we see today. Shane O'Sullivan just recently came out with the, this incredible documentary about the Zapruder film where Douglas Horn and Peter Janney did interviews with Dino Bugioni, where they finally uh, expose the exact movements of the Zapruder film. There's a note at the beginning of the documentary where Shane O'Sullivan notes that he cannot use the actual film movement that the uh, the film itself in the in his documentary because he's been threatened by the Sixth Floor Museum that they would sue him if he would do it. <laughs> so so uh, it, comes, it all comes full circle here with the Sixth 
uh, Buffalo Museum now has the complete rights to both the Zapruder and the mixed film, mm. and they're, they keep suppressing it. You know, I just think okay. Orwell was just such a nice guy and such a patriot and an American that he was just taken advantage of like that. All right, we got one more minute. Larry, let's go ahead and wrap it up. So, and, and, and it's uh, very painful to me to read the details of what ultimately happened with the copyrights of the mixed film, you know, and how they ended up with the Sixth Floor Museum. And it's it's very, very tragic indeed that instead of moving forward in, in the uh, case of the assassination, it seems like we keep moving backwards. Very tragic in my mind. I congratulate Gail for uh, being as brave as she has been in telling the story to the American public and see if uh, maybe uh, they'll wake up and realize that there's a lot of things that have been suppressed and, and that needs to be brought out. As she says at the beginning of, the, of, of her book, you know, that this is a call for action and hopefully uh, the American public will heed this call. That's right, it is thank a call you, to Gary. action. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Yeah, appreciate you being on, Larry. It is a call to action, and that's why we're here, and we're going to dig more into it in the very near future. Thanks again for being on the show, Larry.